Chemistry lecture number 42, polar and nonpolar molecules. An ionic bond occurs when one electron is transferred from one atom to another. A covalent bond occurs when electrons are shared between atoms. And we can use the difference in electronegativity between two atoms to determine if the bond formed between them is ionic or covalent. Now that's a chart of electronegativity and you should be aware that different textbooks sometimes have different values for electronegativity. Now remember that electronegativity is the ability of an atom to pull electrons towards itself when those electrons are shared uh, between atoms. As you go from left to right across the chart, the electronegativity increases, and the bigger the electronegativity number, the greater its ability to pull electrons towards itself. So this is the chart I'm gonna be using. Electronegativity values range from 0.7 to 3.98. If the difference in electronegativity is relatively small, uh, the bond is going to be covalent. Now, for example, the difference in electronegativity between oxygen and nitrogen is 3.44 minus 3.04. So oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.44, nitrogen has an electronegativity of 3.04. These are pretty close in value, so <clears throat> when you subtract it, you get a small number, a relatively small number. So the difference in electronegativity is relatively small, so the electrons will be equally shared between the two atoms and the bond will be covalent. They both have kind of a close drawing strength, so in a tug of war between the oxygen and the nitrogen, uh, the electrons tend to stay in the middle. Now, if the difference in electronegativity is relatively large, the bond will be ionic. For example, <coughs> for example the difference in electronegativity between uh, fluorine and francium is 3.98 minus 0.7. So fluorine has a strong electronegativity, 3.98. Francium has a relatively weak one. So if you subtract, you see there's a large difference in uh, drawing strength between these two. F is much stronger than FR. So that's a relatively large difference. So thus a bond between fluorine and francium will be ionic. The electrons are gonna be transferred to the fluorine because fluorine has a bigger number. It's stronger. But in reality, most bonds are neither entirely covalent nor ionic. Since electrons between atoms are in constant motion, there are times when the electrons are shared and times when they're transferred. At best, we can say that a bond is mostly covalent or mostly ionic. If the difference in electronegativity is less than 1.7, the bond is mostly covalent. If the difference in electronegativity is greater than 1.7, the bond is mostly ionic. And if the difference is equal to 1.7, uh, the bond is 50% covalent and 50% ionic. So <clears throat> it has to be a big difference uh, between the uh, two atoms' electronegativity strength for it to be considered uh, ionic. And even then, part of the time, it's going to be covalent. So the only time a pure covalent bond occurs is when two identical atoms form a bond, such as in H2. So if you have two hydrogen atoms bonded together, um, in this, circumstance, so the, in this circumstance, the difference in electronegativity is zero since both atoms share the exact same electronegativity strength. This atom pulls on these electrons just as hard as this atom. See, so the electrons stay in between. And in fact, the electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.2. Well, they both have a strength of 2.2. So 2.2 minus 2.2 is zero, all right? No difference in electronegativity. So the electrons stay in the middle. In covalent bonds, the electrons, with the, uh, the, uh, the electrons between the atoms will move closer to the atom with greater electronegativity. If the electrons spend a significant amount of time closer to one atom, it gives the atom a partial negative charge. Now, when such electrons are shared unequally in a covalent bond, we say it's a polar covalent bond. A bond will be polar covalent if the difference in electronegativity is greater than 0.4. So if the difference is 0.4, that means that one atom is just strong enough to pull the electrons towards itself um, a significant amount of time and give it a partial negative charge. The unequal sharing of electrons in a covalent bond can create a polar molecule. And a polar molecule is, has a negative charge on one side and a positive charge on the other side. Polar molecules are also called dipoles. Uh, polar molecules are made when the molecule has polar covalent bonds and when the molecule has the correct shape. So for example, H2O has polar covalent bonds and a bent shape. So that is the shape of water. So the oxygen's in the middle and the hydrogen's under each end has a bent shape. So uh, if we orient it this way, the molecule has sort of a top and a bottom to it. All right, it wouldn't have a top and a bottom if it wasn't bent, but the bent shape gives it uh, a top and a bottom. 
All right. Now, <clears throat> that's this redrawn. So let's take a look at this. Um, so the symbol shows uh, above the oxygen means that the oxygen has a partial negative charge, and the symbol above the hydrogens means partial positive charge. So those squiggly little Greek lines means partial. So partial positive, partial negative. And the oxygen develops a partial negative charge because it has an electronegativity of 3.44, which is greater than that of hydrogen, right? So oxygen has a strength of 3.44. That's bigger than the electronegativity of hydrogen, which means that these electrons that are in between uh, the oxygen and the hydrogen, these electrons get pulled towards the oxygen. And when the electrons get pulled towards the oxygen, the oxygen develops a partial uh, negative charge. And by the way, there should be some electrons on the, these are unshared electrons that are on there. Anyway, but these electrons get pulled towards the oxygens, develops a partial negative charge. And when the electrons are pulled away from the hydrogens, they develop a partial positive charge. All right, so, let's see here. <clears throat> now as a result, the water molecule is gonna be partially negative on top, uh, and it's gonna be partially positive on the bottom. Water is therefore a polar molecule. And one way you can tell if something's a polar molecule is if you can draw a single line through the picture of the molecule and have all the negative on one side and all the positive on the other side, it's gonna be polar. So I can just draw a straight line like, whoops, didn't draw it right, sorry. If I draw a line like this, sorry. So let's say, well, this is, will be our line. So this line puts the negative on this side and the positive on that side. So that's how we know it's going to be a, a polar molecule. <clears throat> Sometimes we use arrows to show the location of the positive and negative charges on the molecule. So <clears throat> this arrow here indicates that along this bond, the negative side is going to be at the tip here. And the positive side, see how there's sort of a plus sign at the end of the arrow? This end of the arrow is the positive side. So along this bond, this is the positive side, that's the negative side. So the bottom of the arrow is the plus side. The tip of the arrow is the negative side. And sometimes we draw a single arrow to show which side of the molecule is negative and which side is positive. So this arrow right here demonstrates that the top of the molecule is negative where the tip is and the bottom of the molecule is positive. So the bottom of the arrow is the plus side, tip of the arrow is the negative side. And sometimes what I like to do is I like to draw it right next to it. You could have drawn it right next to it to show that the bottom is positive and the top is negative. So the way to determine if a molecule is polar is to figure out where the partial positive and negative charges develop. If it's possible to draw a straight line through the diagram and have all the positive charge on one side and all the negative charge on the other side, then you have a polar molecule. So let's figure out if uh, NH3 is going to be a polar molecule. Now a Lewis dot diagram of NH3 is going to look like this. Three atoms attached with an unshared pair of electrons, but this has a three-dimensional shape. So, <clears throat> this is a three-dimensional shape. So, is this a polar molecule? Well, the central atom has an unshared pair of electrons on top here, and there are three terminal atoms right here, and thus it has a three-dimensional pyramidal shape. And this is the three-dimensional pyramidal shape. All right, it has a top and a bottom if I orient it in this fashion. All right, so NH3 does have a three-dimensional shape, a top and a bottom. All right, so there is our three-dimensional shape. All right, now nitrogen has an electronegativity of 3.04, while that of hydrogen is 2.20. So the electrons right here are gonna move closer to the nitrogen. All right, so the electrons move closer here. In fact, I can even do something like that. And these electrons, they're gonna go like that. And these electrons along here, they're gonna move up like that. All right, and as a net result, the top of the molecule is negative and the bottom is positive and thus, NH3 is a polar molecule. So this is a polar molecule. And again, 
Can we draw a line through this molecule and get the negative on one side and the positive on the other side? Uh, yes, we can. If I draw it right, if I go like this, so the negative is on this side and the positive is on the bottom. Right. Let's try another molecule. Let's see if CO2 <coughs> is going to be a uh, polar molecule. A Lewis dot diagram of CO2 is going to look like this. Okay, central atom with two atoms attached to it. <clears throat> this is redrawing it. All right, so the central atom has two terminal atoms attached, so it's just going to have a linear shape, a straight line. Uh, carbon has an electronegativity of 2.55, so carbon's electronegativity is 2.55, and oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.44. So oxygen has a greater electronegativity. So the electrons in here that are shared are going to move closer to the oxygen. Likewise, the, ox the electrons here are going to move closer to the oxygen uh, in this direction also. <clears throat> then you see these little arrows here indicating the direction in which the electrons are going to move. So it looks like it's going to make uh, a negative charge on this end and then it'll make a negative charge on this end and it'll leave a positive charge on the carbon. So the positive charge is in the middle of the molecule. Now is there a way to draw a line through this molecule and have all the positive on one side and all the negative on the other side? Nope, no way to draw a line through the molecule and have the positive on one side and the negative on the other side. So in a sense, these polarity arrows cancel each other. All right, and <clears throat> that shows us that this is a nonpolar molecule. There's no way to get all the positive on one side and all the negative on the other side. So this is nonpolar. For a PDF transcript of this lecture, go to www.richardlouis.com. This has been chemistry lecture number 42, Polar and Nonpolar Molecules.